a subject that I think is in the next month or so will be quite prominent in the in the bourgeois press, since it's it, it's a 30 year anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall, and I think they will say more or less the same things as as they said back then, uh, that it was a victory of freedom, that it was also it was claimed the end of history. I think history now, just the last month, has showed that it, it didn't end uh, 30 years ago. And also they said that this was uh, the victory of capitalism over communism. Now we would just live in the best of the capitalist free world uh, ever. And I think if you look at capitalism for ju just the last 10 years, it's, it's also quite clear that capitalism is not doing uh, so great either. And then the last part of this sentence is, it was the victory of capitalism over communism. Uh, and for us, uh, for Marxists, it, it was very clear that what failed in the Soviet Union uh, and in Eastern Europe, it wasn't communism. Uh, it was Stalinist regimes. It was degenerated or deformed worker states uh, that fell in the Soviet Union. And that was the reason why, in the end, it, it, it had to fall. Um, and I will come back to that. What was the reason for the, for the fall of the Soviet Union and, and what kind of regimes was it? But first, I wanted to go a bit into... Um, to the movement around the fall of, of the Berlin Wall. Um, and I think if you, if you look at this regime and saw how dictatorial many of them were, it's quite impressive. If you look at the movements around the fall of the Berlin Wall, they were not movements for going to capitalism. Uh, it was not movement for the free market as it is claimed today. It was actually movement uh, that, that wanted freedom, that wanted democracy, but not on a capitalist basis. Um, and I think that is quite impressive when you look at, at these regimes and all the propaganda being, being spread now. Um, the fall of the Berlin Wall on the 9th of November, 1989, very soon, 30 years ago, it was the result of a wave of movement in 89, starting a bit before, that spread from capital to capital in the Eastern European countries in the, in the Soviet Union. Already in the early 80s, there had been strikes in Poland, um, sort of like the first signs of something brewing in, in these countries. Um, and, and also a, an expression of the blind alley that all these regimes were, were more and more finding themselves in, uh, all these uh, Stalinist regimes. And, and an expression also of the fact that the, the planned economy were, were more and more stagnating, if you can say that. <laughs> they were more and more going towards zero and not being able to, to develop society and, and develop the lives of, of the population in the Soviet Union. Um, and so the economy stagnated and these regimes, especially the Russian, they came into crisis and, and was much weakened. And that also meant that when the movements erupted in 89, where earlier on in East Germany 53, Hungary 56, Czechoslovakia 68, the Red Army from Moscow would just come in and crush the, the uprising. In 89, the, the Russian regime was so weak uh, and, and in internal crisis that they couldn't just send in the Red Army and just, just uh, crush the movements that, that had erupted. Uh, so that was also why these, these movements could actually uh, lead further than, than earlier. Um, yeah, so already, um, it, before the fall of the Berlin Wall, you could see all over, uh, all across 89, um, that, that there were movements leading up to, to this um, culmination, you could say. Uh, in Poland, in the elections in 1989, uh, the, the Solidarność, which was the, the trade union leading the strikes in the early 80s, they were allowed for the first time to run in the elections. <coughs> uh, and they won all the seats that they were allowed to contest which really showed, uh, showed the, the mood of, of discontent and looking for some, uh, some other way. In Hungary, uh, they, they decided on a democracy package, trying to make reforms to lighten up the regime, to make people, you know, reform from above to try and, and keep revolution from below uh, from happening. In Prague in November 89, there were mass demonstrations uh, of half a million and there were strikes, but the most explosive uh, situation was in East Germany, um, which was also the most industrialized uh, part of the Soviet Union or of, of East, uh, Eastern Europe, and the most experienced working class, the most educated working class. 
Um, and the leader of Eastern Germany, Erich Honecker, he was a hardline Stalinist. Um, and he was applicably opposed to any reform. There were a lot of discussions in the ruling uh, circles of these regimes at the time. Was it time to have some reforms in order to, to try to avoid revolution from below, or should you just try to crush it? And Honecker was one of the hardline crushers, just ruled, rooted all out by the roots, uh, you can say. Uh, but one thing is to wanting to do this. Another thing is to be able to do it, and that's another thing. And, but the, the movement in East Germany sprang up. It, it started around um, the city of Leipzig. I'm not German. I don't know if I say it correctly. Uh, <laughs> no, Leipzig, something like that. Uh, Leipzig, OK. Good, sorry. Um, and, and it was very uh, politically confused. It sprang up uh, around, actually, the services uh, in the Nikolai Church, uh, because that was one of the places people could meet. Uh, and there were weekly demonstrations in Leipzig. Um, and it was, of course, very politically confused. And this, mo but this movement spread to uh, all the other cities in eastern Euro uh, in East uh, Germany, uh, demanding that something happened. But what was very clear in these movements was that they knew what they didn't want, but it was not very clear what they wanted, um, because they just wanted that things should change. It it should be different. Uh, and there was no one to give it any political lead, to give it any leadership. Um, and, and the regime went into crisis, and it, was, it became quite clear that they couldn't, uh, like Honecker wanted, they couldn't just crash down on the movement. And if they had done it, it might just have led to even bigger <laughs> explosions. Uh, so, so the Honecker government had to resign, and they put in uh, another also a Stalinist, but a more moderate uh, kind, called uh, Egon Krenz, <coughs> um, who, who tried to open up, saying we should have uh, elections. But at this time, already the movement, like we see today now, it's not about the initial demand or about one thing. We should, OK, if we have elections, then we're satisfied and, and we go home. It was too little, and it was too late. Uh, these, these attempts of reforming the regimes in a more democratic uh, way um, and they are obviously also, because they were Stalinists, also considered using force. Uh, and they actually consulted with Moscow. But Moscow was very clear at this point that they, was, they were not going to get help from Moscow in, in any way because they didn't have the forces and because they thought it would even lead to even greater explosions. So the Eastern uh, German uh, government were, were left to, to themselves. Uh, and, and to be honest, they had no power anymore. The movement had already gone further than, than what could be controlled uh, and, and got a momentum of, uh, of its own. And it was quite clear, one thing is if you are in, in the middle of it, it's quite clear looking back on it. Uh, I think this is sometimes something we forget. One thing is to be in the middle of it, seeing what is the situation. When we look back to it, it's very clear to see that at this point, the, the, the power was actually in the, in the streets. Uh, because the government couldn't do anything. This mighty state, Stasi <laughs> state, with a Stasi agent in all building blocks and workplaces, they were powerless. They couldn't, they couldn't stop the movement from happening and, and going on. Um, but the problem is, and the problem was, which is, it is also today, there was no one to pick it up. There was no one to give it any political direction uh, in any sense. Uh, which I think, if you look at the history of, of the Soviet Union and these regimes, it's quite obvious why the left wing were quite decimated uh, at this point, the, the real revolutionary left wing. Um, but, but this mighty Eastern U uh, German state ended collapsing like a house of cards. Uh, on November 9, after weeks of these mass uprisings, the East German government announced that East German citizens were allowed to visit West Western Germany. Uh, and they didn't say how or when. Uh, but this, and I think this was also an attempt to, to soften up, to say we, we, it will become better, we will reform, just wait and, and see. But it just created an even bigger explosion. Uh, and I can understand if you're a, a citizen in, in East Berlin, you think they, they say we're allowed to go to West Germany. Let's do it. So they went to the wall, which has been. <laughs> 
a place where people have been killed trying to cross, but just the masses flooded to the Berlin Wall and started to climb it. Uh, and, and the guards didn't dare to do anything about it. I think they were quite shocked <coughs> and, and perplexed, thinking, what the hell are we supposed to do? <laughs> okay, <laughs> we'll, we just let it happen. And these uh, East Germans, they were met by jubilant West German uh, citizens on, on the other side. And I think all have seen these scenes of jubilation and people just partying. Uh, uh, this is one of the first thing I remember seeing on television, and I didn't. Un I was nine at the time. I didn't understand it, but I remember my parents just being, "Oh, this is this is massive. This is like a, his a historical event," and people all over Europe, in jubilant that now you actually had, uh, you had this hated wall, and I think it was hated on both sides, being uh, torn down by by ordinary citizens, um, and the f this. This was a period, also the first period after, of euphoria. And I think this is very common in the beginning of a revolutionary situation. This, we, can, we can do everything. We, we have power. Uh, people could feel that, that things were changing. But it's not enough to be euphoric. Like we know, it's not enough to, to overthrow a government or to overthrow a wall. Uh, you have to have something to put instead. And this was the, the problem in, in all these movements, or in also in East Germany, that there was nothing to be put instead uh, at this time. Um, where all the objective conditions for a political revolution was there, if there had been a, a genuine Marxist tendency in East Germany at this time, who had posed the, the idea <laughs> of, of creating a worker state, of, of having a planned economy, of keeping that, but but introducing workers' democracy and the workers' running of, e of the economy, that could have succeeded, but there was nothing of the kind. And the fact of, of East Germany was that this vacuum existing <coughs> within the movement was very quickly filled by a very rich and very powerful neighbor called West Germany, uh, which had all the resources in the world to, to fill this vacuum. Um, and. And, and to put forward the demand, which became then the, the main demand after some time, but it wasn't in the beginning, but the demand of the reunification of Germany. And it's clear when this demand came from coal, <laughs> from West Germany, it was reunification re on a capitalist basis. Uh, that was quite obvious. But they presented it like, now the German people have to be united, uh, which was correct, <laughs> but not on a, on a <coughs> capitalist basis. Um, and, and this, uh, start, this, this demand started to gain ground. And also Cole, he made a, a smart trick. He, uh, he tried to bribe, and partly succeeded, I think, the Eastern European population saying, we will do a one-to-one -one swap uh, for Eastmark, which was the East German uh, uh, currency. currency, thank you, <laughs> money, the East, current, uh, East German currency, to uh, Deutschmark, the, the West German currency, which meant you would get a lot more buying power uh, for your money. But this is quite clearly a one-off. Okay, you have some money, you get more money, but this is, <laughs> this is like a bit like peeing in your pants. <laughs> you get heavy <laughs> for quite a short amount of time, and then it's not so pleasant in, in, in the long run. Um, <laughs> okay, that was a bit, a bit strange, maybe. <laughs> but, but what they also promised was that they would also be happy in the long run, that the East Germans, they would end up having the same living standards as, as the West Germans. This is a, a Danish saying. <laughs> Sorry if it's not known to say. <laughs> And on October 1990, the reunification was officially uh, carried through, uh, and uh, on a capitalist basis, of course. The, this, the, the process uh, in Russia happened in a, in a bit of a different form, and it was, you can read this book, which is really good, the last afterward deals with the whole, um, with the whole process of, uh, of the collapse of the Soviet Union. And I won't go into detail, because I think this is not what this talk is about, and also I think people can read the book. But the, the, the process was a bit uh, more drawn out. Uh, in 89, there were strikes in different mines uh, against the deteriorating uh, living standards, uh, because the economy had been stagnating for quite a while, the living standards were falling, so the workers began to, um, to strike, demanding better wages and so on. Uh, it was not demands for capitalism, um, but it was demands for 
bringing the economy forward and, and for improving the lives of, of the workers. And the regime was in dissolution. But the, the main factors in the, in the dissolution of the Soviet Union was not the masses in Russia themselves, even though there were strikes and some demonstrations, but it was different wings inside the bureaucracy fighting each other for which way forward. Uh, and in the end, the Yeltsin uh, wing won, uh, which was the pro-capitalist uh, wing. Uh, there was a coup and there was counter attacks uh, and all these kind of things. But it, I think the main thing was that the, it wasn't a mass movement in Russia that ended up uh, ending the Soviet Union. Uh, and and these, uh, the Yeltsin wing uh, started to introduce uh, capitalist reforms. Um, and it had catastrophic results. If you look at, um, in 91, the USSR was dissolved. And if you look at the economy, from 1990 to 95, the production fell by 60%, which was after a period of a long period of stagnation. But, but <laughs> I remember when I started at my university, we had an economy course, and we had a book uh, about economy, uh, macro economy. And the first chapter was, why was uh, capitalism a superior? Uh, and, you, and the example was the Soviet Union. But when you looked at all the figures, <laughs> It, it was the wrong it, it was the wrong way around, and I never understood how they used this figure <coughs> to argue the opposite of what the figures actually said. Because what you saw was, when the Soviet Union fell, all the economic statistics just <coughs> collapsed. Um, it was a collapse of production, and it was a collapse of living standards in these countries, and and not least <coughs> in in Russia. Between ninety one and ninety three, real wages fell by forty three percent in Russia. Uh, it meant that one third lived below poverty line. Um, and I think a really good indicator uh, of how much the living standards plummet is the, the average living age for men in Russia that fell from 65.1 years old in 87 to 59 years in 93, which is more than, more than six years that the, the average living age fell normally. <laughs> It goes forward, and then it's, if there is a big war, a lot of men are killed, and then maybe the average age uh, fall. But this was not a war situation. This was capitalism coming to save the Russian workers uh, by reducing their living age with the six years. Um, yes. So now we will have all these jubilant uh, articles, and I'm sure uh, television programs. I think, I don't know if there are any uh, Germans here. I think in Germany it must be just massive. It's already starting in, in the Danish media. Uh, and there will be all these histories about how much better it, it has become. And I think this is also something we have to go into. Has it actually become better for the people? One thing is that the immediate collapse. Now they had 30 years to prove that capitalism is, um, is um, superior. Uh, and there, there will be all kinds of statistics and so on. Yeah, and I looked at some, some um, opinion polls, and uh, if you look at the percentage of people in the former Eastern European countries, uh, they were asked um, if they approved that their country moved from having a state-controlled economy to having a market economy. And it is less people now who approve this than it was in 91. So it has actually fallen, and I think this shows the impasse of capitalism. It's still a majority in most of the countries, but it is at a smaller majority now than it was 30 years ago. And in Russia, and in six out of eight countries, uh, not all of them, in Russia and Ukraine, there were more people who, who, were, who weren't agreeing with this. They said it was better before. They didn't approve this move to, to market economy. And in Russia, Ukraine, and Bulgaria, uh, they say, that a majority say that the eco economic situation for most people today is worse than it was under communism. Um, and it is only in Poland and the Czech Republic that a majority <coughs> thinks that it has gotten better for the big majority. And I think this is quite saying of the situation 30 years on the fall of the Berlin Wall. If you ask them about health, education, and so on, it's also a majority who think it was better before. Um, so I think we will have a lot of jubilant <coughs> history.
speeches and articles, but I think this is the real fact for the majority of people. It's clear for a small ma minority in all these countries, they got way better off, uh, much, much richer, even if that was possible. But for the great majority, lives actually ended up being, uh, being worse. Um, so let's go into what was these uh, what was these regimes? But because if you if you also look at these opinion polls, it also said is life better now than it was under communism, and this is what they still say. Uh, and I think this is one of the main, how can you say, arguments when you meet someone when you sell the paper or something, you still you still met with this, especially from older people. But what about the Soviet Union? Do you want it to be like the Soviet Union? What about Stalin? And <coughs> you have to be able to answer it. And I think all of us need to be able to answer this because it's quite important, not just to answering an old cranky lady uh, on the street <laughs> corner, but also in order to understand what actually went wrong. Why did it end up collapsing? And was that really what we want? Uh, I think uh, there are many things in these kind of regimes we don't want, and, and it's not what we're fighting for. Um, and I think actually today, I think that has changed. Uh, that could also be interesting to discuss, but I think it is changing. As long as the Soviet Union existed, uh, there was this argument, so what about the Soviet Union? But I think today, with all this, I don't know if I can say it like this, but <laughs> degeneration of the left wing into uh, individual identity politics, it actually, when it pushes some of the more serious the young people looking for answers on the left wing, away from that, they, they end up looking to the Soviet Union and to Stalinism. And I'm not that much into a different internet fora, <laughs> but I have been told <laughs> that on the internet fora, different kinds, the Stalinists are actually gaining quite a lot of attraction. So I think we also need to be able to, those who are, who are going away from petty bourgeois left-wing politics, they shouldn't end up in the Stalinist camp. Mm -hmm. They should end up in our camp because we are the real defenders of the Soviet Union, the planned economy, mm -hmm. and the only ones who can actually explain what went wrong and why it, why it ended up failing uh, and, and developed as it, as it did. And Stalinism, we, we have just produced a theoretical magazine on, on the issue on, on the subject, and <laughs> I really struggle, how do you define Stalinism? Because it's not like Marxism. Marxism is, is like, you can say, it has three component parts, uh, philosophy, uh, history, and economics. Stalinism, it, it's not a set of ideas. It didn't arise like some Stalin <laughs> sat down and thought, how do I think the Soviet <laughs> Union should develop? Uh, how, what do I think about society? Th this was not <laughs> like, this is, you can't take a book and say, okay, this was Stalin's thought, and this is uh, Stalinism. Uh, you can only understand Stalinism as the concrete expression, uh, the political expression of the political degeneration of the Russian Revolution. You can only understand it is in its historical context. Um, and I think this process has been best explained by Trotsky in The Revolution Betrayed in the, in the book uh, from 36. Uh, and where he actually also predicted that, the, that if, if, there if the workers in Russia didn't carry through a political revolution, then the Soviet Union would end up collapsing. Um, and at that time, I think many people on the left wing thought he was completely crazy, and it took a bit longer than he thought. Uh, but, but still, he was absolutely correct in, in analyzing the, the underlying processes and, and internal contradictions in the Soviet Union to see what would, what would eventually happen if, if the workers didn't intervene to change the course of, of, um, of development. And, and the main thing, and I think this is something we really need to stress, the main explanation, which is very short, and of course you need to know a bit more than this very short thing, was that he said that Stalinism and the degeneration of the Russian Revolution came from the objective conditions of the isolation of the Russian Revolution in a backward country. This is like the main, if you have to explain it very shortly, this is our explanation. An isolated revolution in a backward country. And if you look at what the Bolsheviks said, they never thought, we, I was just at the China discussion, and somebody raised the question of, is it possible to build socialism in one country? 
he didn't say that, but <laughs> in relation to China. And there was no one in the Marxist camp before Stalin, but, but during the, the Russian Revolution and so on, there was no one who could ever imagine posing the question of creating socialism in one country. Uh, if you look at what Lenin and the Bolsheviks said, and Marx and Engels and all the others, but also Lenin and the Bolsheviks that Stalin, he, he and the Stalinists say that they are the uh, heritage of, uh, they never said <laughs> that we should try and build socialism in Russia or that it was possible. What they said from the beginning was that the Russian Revolution should be the spark that ignited the world revolution. And they said it quite <laughs> concretely, actually. We cannot build socialism in Russia. We can, we can be the beginning of the revolution, but then we will need the help from the advanced capitalist countries, the workers, to take power in their countries and come to our aid so we together can build socialism. So it was never in their mind, and, and Lenin actually said he was prepared to um, sacrifice the Russian Revolution for the German, because the German Revolution were more important for, for world revolution. Um, so it was, it was quite clear that this was, uh, was the line of, of the Bolsheviks. And, and this, this was also what happened. The Russian Revolution was the spark that it ignited a worldwide revolutionary uh, movement. The problem was the lack of leadership. That's subject for other discussions, what went wrong in the German Revolution and so on. But, but, but this was the main, this was like the, um, the germ of the degeneration of the Russian Revolution, that all these revolutions that happened throughout the world, that they ended up being defeated. Uh, so, so the Russian Revolution stood, stood back as the only one. And if you look at the, f the first period after the revolution in 1917 and onwards, it's clear that all the, all the steps that the Bolsheviks are taking, they're taking it as measures necessary imposed upon them because of this isolation in order to just hang on with the <laughs> tip of their fingernails until the revolution comes to their aid in other countries. So just to, to keep power uh, in order for, for the isolation, just to wait for the isolation to be broken. And they took many steps that you wouldn't have taken in Germany after a German revolution because the economic situation in Germany were quite different. Uh, and I think this is something that is also really important for us to understand. Uh, there was a discussion of blueprints at the China discussion. Do we take everything that every Marxist have ever written and say this is exactly word by word what we should do? If we take anything Lenin said, uh, from 1917 until he died, and say this is how we should implement socialism in each and every country after the revolution, it would be very wrong. We have to understand why do, did they take the steps that they took at the time that they took them? What was, was, what, what was the conditions that compelled them to do it? Uh, and then understand the method in it. Yes. <coughs> so, so, this, so this was the conditions of, of the Russian Revolution. Um, and this idea of building socialism in one country uh, and, and Stalinism, it arose out of these concrete conditions in Russia after the revolution. Um, yeah, uh, of, if we look at Stalinism, of course, if we look at it today, it is a set of ideas. It is a set of ideas that became princip Marxist principles or whatever, Marxist-Leninist principles, Stalinist principles that arose out of <laughs> what what ideas the Stalinist bureaucracy needed in order to justify the steps that they took in Russia after, after 1924, <coughs> basically. Um, and, and it is ideas that has played and still uh, continues to play a very reactionary role in history and, and labor movements throughout, uh, throughout the world. So it is ideas we need to understand and, and we need to fight. Um, yes, and it is complete uh, anti-Marxist ideas uh, this idea of, of socialism in one country, for example, it is, <laughs> I think it's quite obvious for everyone who sits in here, uh, Marx explained how capitalism is a global economic system, how all economi uh, economies are completely intertwined, uh, and this is what have, have made uh, it possible for us to produce enough now for everybody to, to get what they need. So you can't go back <laughs> and isolate each economy. You need this a division of labor, this uh, uh, a global economy in order to actually further humanity, further production. 
uh, and therefore socialism needs to be international and not just in, in one country. Um, and up until, uh, I think actually early 24 or late 23 at least, Stalin wrote uh, an article and ha held speeches where he, he uh, explained this political line of the Bolsheviks. Uh, the Russian Revolution just needs to hold, hold on until the World Revolution comes to its aid. Right. Uh, and then uh, six months after Lenin uh, died, uh, in, he died in January 24, uh, Stalin wrote the exact opposite. There's a really funny speech where he tries to explain how, he, he, how what he says is actually what he said earlier also. <laughs> uh, and it is really, really <laughs> strange to try and follow his arguments beca uh, because it was different. And if you look at it from two different sides, then it is, uh, and it doesn't make any sense because he basically just swatch 180% to the opposite. Now it's possible to build socialism in Russia, and this is what we should focus on. Um, yes. And what it actually expressed, and I think this is a very good um, example of what was, what was going on in Russia at this time, was that this idea expressed uh, the growing uh, power of the bureaucracy and the Russian state and their interests. And their interests were not and I'm, I'm coming back to why this bureaucratization uh, grew and, and how it happened. But their interests were not world revolution uh, or, or workers' democracy. Their interests were keeping their power and their privileges intact. And in order to do that, they needed as much order and calm. They didn't need the stress and chaos of revolutionary upheavals. They needed, let's plan. We all know the type. Let's plan. Let's do it, no matter what happened. Uh, and then we just keep everything intact and, and go forward. And that was their social interest. Uh, and Stalin was just the, how can you say, he was just the personal, uh, the personification of, of this bureaucracy. Um, and if it hadn't been for Stalin, it would have been someone, someone else. And it, Stalinism would have been called something completely different. Um, yes. So how could this happen? That suddenly in quite a short period from, from 17 to 24, we have, we have a situation where <laughs> the leader, the general secretary of the Bolshevik party can go out and say what we're fighting for is socialism in one country. How, and how could the degeneration of the revolution happen? And if you, if you read, also left-wing historians, but if you, especially if you read bourgeois historians, they will say it was, it, was, um, it was a fight, a clash between personalities. I don't know how many times I read, but Trotsky, he just wasn't smart enough. <laughs> he, or he wasn't brutal enough. But Stalin, he was, he was like the, like the, he was committed. So that is why he won. And I think that is a very superficial uh, explanation. Uh, and it also, do it doesn't explain anything uh, because there are many uh, determined people in history. And I think Trotsky was a very determined uh, person in history also. But it was a question of the objective uh, uh, conditions. And if we look at Russia, it was extremely backward at this time. Uh, beside that, it had been completely crushed, the economy, in the First World War, and then we had the Civil War that even destroyed the economy more. It was not until 1926 that they reached the same level of production as they did in, in 23. Um, and the social base of, of this bureaucracy that grew out was the petty bourgeoisie, especially the peasants. Uh, the small landowners. And during the Civil War, the Bolsheviks had had to take quite harsh measures called war communism. And one of the main features <coughs> of that was saying the, the workers were, were starving and the soldiers in the Red Army were starving. Uh, and, the, and what they did, they needed grain, they needed food for the workers not to starve. So they went into the countryside and they took the grain from the peasants. And it's quite clear I think it's quite clear for everyone. It's, you don't have to be a big psychologist to see this. If you're a peasant and the state comes and take your grain, you, you get pissed off. Especially because <laughs> the state, they didn't have anything to offer back because the in industry was completely crushed. Um, but this was necessary in order for not letting the workers um, die of hunger, basically. Um, but it also became clear that when the Civil War ended, they had to take steps in order <laughs> to, to accommodate the peasants, which was the great majority of the Russian population. So they took some initiative called the New Economic Policy, the NEP, which was uh, admissions to capitalism. It was allowing 
uh, more free market within the grain um, market. So, so allowing the peasants to sell grain on the market. And of course this meant that there was a differentiation, a social differentiation within <coughs> the peasantry. Those peasants who were already a bit rich could get richer, start to employ the, the poorer peasants. And a whole layer of so-called nepmen, who were the people who traded between the countryside and, and the cities, also began to grow up and become more and more powerful. And this was like the social base of this, um, of this bureaucracy. Um, yes, this, this petty bourgeois uh, that, that was growing inside, uh, inside Russia. And also, at the same time, uh, a, a petty bourgeoisie in, in a bit of, of another respect, not in respect to property, uh, but in respect to their position in society, began to grow up. Uh, if you look at the bureaucracy in the state, it grew like enormously. Um, in 1920, uh, the number of, of people employed in the state had risen from 100,000 to, f in 1917, <coughs> to 5,880,000. It's quite an exposure, yeah, a large growth. <coughs> um, and that was five times the number of workers. So it showed <laughs> the workers, uh, their force in society were being undermined. And also the workers' democracy had been undermined during the Civil War. Uh, a lot of the workers had been sent to the front. They were like the, f the front fighters in, in the Red Army. Uh, a lot of them had had to just flee the cities because there was no food to, to, to get. Um, and and uh, for example, the number of, of industrial workers had fallen from 1.2 million, no, from 3 million to 1.2 million in 1920. The, the population of Petrograd had fallen from 2.4 million to, to 574,000 uh, know, in the same period. So, so the working class, the power of the working class was really being undermined be because of the objective conditions. The plan of the Bolsheviks was to revive the Soviets, the workers' democracy, once the civil war was over. But, but then other things uh, came, uh, came across. And if we look at the people working in the state, a lot of them were, were former uh, Tsarist officials uh, because generally the population in Russia, they couldn't read and they couldn't write. Uh, and they needed the new <coughs> regime, they needed experts, both <coughs> in the state and in the military. And they tried to control them politically. But if you pr suddenly have 5.8 million uh, <laughs> who, who you have to control and you have a working class of less than 3 million, it's, it's a bit difficult. Uh, so, and, and it's clear that the former Tsarist officials, they didn't have any interest in communism or revolution or anything. They had an interest in their own, own <coughs> social position in society and their privileges. And in order to keep them, you also, the, the Bolsheviks needed to give them some privileges for them not to flee out of the country. So while the communists, um, officials, they had a party maximum. They, ha they could only earn the same as, as a skilled worker. Then all these old officials, they needed to, some, some kind you can say, bribe them in order to stay and help uh, building uh, the worker state. But it was also clear that this was a big uh, danger. And Lenin warned uh, repeatedly and more and more uh, towards uh, his death against this bureaucratization in the state and actually saying, we are not running the state, the state is running us. Um, and, and saying this is the main problem uh, that we have to fight. And this, this uh, also started to affect the Bolshevik party itself. During the civil war, the, the doors had been completely open. Everybody could join because it was, if they, if they lost, you would be killed probably. Uh, so it was, okay, if you wanna fight with us, do it. But it, towards the end of the war, it became clear who was going to win. So everybody who wanted a career after were very clever to join before the war ended. And it, the party was just swarmed with careerists, uh, a lot of them former Mensheviks and so on. It meant that the party did a purge in 21. I've heard Stalinists say, yeah, we did purges, but Lenin also did a purge. <laughs> but if you look at the purge in 21, it was they expelled people from the party. That's it. You're expelled, we think you're a careerist. Out. The purges in, in the 30s under Stalin is quite a different uh, kind of, of purchase. You were sent to Gulag and uh, worked to that in, in a work camp um, uh, while you were being tortured until you gave an, how do you say that? Confession. Confession. Thank you. Um, 
Yes. So, so they had begun to purge the party because that was still essential in order to keep the worker state in Russia. Uh, but shortly after the death of Lenin, the, the new triumvirate in the, in the party, uh, Stalin, Sinovyev and Kamenev, they, they uh, put forward this idea of a Lenin levy, open the doors to the party and just swamp uh, the party. Also as a way of them gaining more control of the party and watering out the old revolutionary elements inside the party. Uh, and if you look at the situation after this Lenin levy, 80% of the party had joined after 23, and less than 1% of the members uh, had, had joined before the revolution. So it showed all these dedicated communists who have been part of the revolutionary process were actually being completely swamped in, in their own party, you could say. So this led uh, the basis for also the degeneration inside the Bolshevik party. Yes. Could it have been different uh, if Lenin had left longer? If, if he hadn't died in January 24. Uh, and that is also always very difficult uh, to answer. What we can say is, if the isolation of the Russian Revolution had been broken at one point in this period, it, it could have changed the course of the situation in Russia. So maybe if Lenin, if he, if he had lived with his, his authority, could have made the, a different outcome in Britain, 26, in China, 27, but he couldn't make a different outcome in Germany in 1919. <laughs> it's not just a question of one man and his authority. It's a question of the objectives, the conditions, and have, they, have the mm -hmm. forces of revolution been built before the revolution breaks out? And we don't know because he died. <laughs> That's a fact of history. So the main thing is that in this period, there were actually also, after Stalin and his clique came to power, there were, there were quite a lot of revolutionary movement that could have broken the isolation of the Russian Revolution, but the Stalinist bureaucracy at this period, they gave the, the worst kind of advice uh, to, um, to these dedicated communists around the, around the world. Not, I think in the beginning because they didn't know better, but then it changed. The more the bureaucracy in the Soviet Union could see that a successful <laughs> revolution in another country <laughs> would undermine their wealth and power because it would be an inspiration to the Russian working class, the more they actively sabotaged the revolution, uh, like they did in Spain in, uh, in 36. And actually Spain, the civil war in Spain and the revolution in Spain was such an inspiration to the workers in Russia that the, that the Stalinist bureaucracy thought th this is too dangerous. And that made them launch the, the purge trials of 36, 37, 38, 39, which swiped out not only Trotskyists, they had already been kicked out the, of the party in 27, but everybody with a memory of the Russian Revolution was being wiped out. And not only that, every dedicated communist, uh, I read some memoirs of, of a communist who, who didn't understand what was going on, but everyone who didn't join in in the process of denouncing other communists, they, was, they were being accused uh, and, uh, and also the those who joined in, they were actually also being accused. So it was like a, a complete snowball that just wiped out the tens of thousands um, of, uh, of communists. <laughs> uh, to, in order to secure the rule of the Stalinist bureaucracy inside Russia, for real, uh, you can say, um, more or less. Um, I am running out of time. Um, yes. What to skip? I think um, yes. I think if we look at Stalinism, of course, a lot of things happen in the period uh, up to the purchase, uh, with the wiping out of the of the left opposition and so on. Uh, and the Stalinist bureaucracy, they swung from one from being very pro kulak, very we should just. Uh, keep this development from the NEP running until they suddenly saw that the Kulaks were actually threatening the regime. They just swung 180 degrees uh, to uh, force collectivization and, uh, and introducing five-year plans, as the left opposition had actually said, but five-year plans in a four-year four period. And I think this is also one of the main characteristics of Stalinism. It's empiricism. They just react to what happens, uh, and then they swing, because they don't understand the process, they swing to the other extreme. Uh, and and um, and implement what has been said 
in <laughs> also in a wrong way. And if we look at the development, and this is one of the things that the Stalinists say today, but look at how well the, the economy developed in the Soviet Union. And if you look at the planned economy in the Soviet Union, it is amazing. It is amazing, and it shows the potential of a planned economy. I think, I don't know where I put the number. I think that the production rose in Soviet Union. I can find the number later. I have it somewhere. I think it rose uh, 52 times or something like that in the period until 53, from 13 to, to 53. And in, in the US, it rose six times. So it really shows the potential. But if you look at the economic development in the Soviet Union, it was not because of the bureaucracy and the way they introduced it. It was despite of it. <laughs> it because <laughs> there was complete waste there was complete mismanagement. If you're not allowed to criticize, if you're not allowed to come with your input, then, then <laughs> and everything has to be decided from the top, you can't develop an economy. In a market economy, then if, if, the, if the good is shit, nobody buys it. But in a planned economy, without democracy, you just produce, because everyone just wants to fill out their quota of production. Uh, and that created, it, it created huge, um, uh, uh, how do you say that, huge progress, but it also created more and more problems for the Soviet economy. And I think this is also what we need to understand, uh, what, what, what lessons that Trotsky and the left opposition uh, said from the beginning. If you have a planned economy, it needs to be international, but it also needs to be democratic, because without democracy, then the, then the planned economy will, will end up dying. Uh, and that is exactly what happened. Uh, after the Second World War, uh, the economy more and more went into crisis and stagnation and couldn't develop further. Uh, and also what happened was, what Trotsky had predicted, at some point the bureaucracy, they will want to become capitalists themselves. Because one thing is to have privilege because of your position. The Stalinist era showed <laughs> that it's very easy to lose your position. Uh, that is one thing. But also you cannot give your wealth to your children to, to inherit. So at some point, they will want to become a capitalist class. And that is also what happened when the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, that, that the Stalinist bureaucracy, they ended up uh, changing themselves into to the new, some of them were lucky, some of them were not. <laughs> but, but mainly, uh, those who became the, the gangster capitalist of Russia were, were former uh, Stalinist uh, bureaucrats. Um, yes. Uh, 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 um, yes. Yes, so in the end, the system collapsed. Uh, and I think we, our position is w something we should be really proud of and that we should really put forward at the present uh, time. Mm -hmm. We need to highlight that we are the ones who are actually the only real defenders of, of, of the heritage of the Soviet Union, which is the massive uh, gains of the planned economy. And we are the only defenders because we knew, we know why it ended in a defeat because it was not an international revolution and be because it was not democratic. Uh, and all those Stalinists who say they actually support or, or are the, those who defend the memory of the Soviet Union, but ask them, so why did it end up collapse? Why did your kind of regime end up collapsing? And they don't have any explanation. Uh, and I think this is, this is what we need to highlight uh, now and to explain that all these ideas that came out of this regime, these, these Stalinist ideas, the idea of socialism in one country, the idea of uh, two-stage uh, uh, reformism, first we should have capitalism and then we can talk about socialism, the nationalist degeneration of the, of the entire third international, the one-party states and the one-line one parties <laughs> where you have not democratic centralism, but only centralism. All these ideas are playing a really reactionary role in the Soviet Union and, and across the world uh, today. Um, so the degeneration of the USSR into Stalinism uh, happened because of objective uh, factors. Uh, and, and these shouldn't make us think they shouldn't have made the Russian Revolution. What was the alternative? It had been fascism in Russia. But it should make us think, what was the main thing lacking at this time? It was a, uh, it was a cater organization on an international scale that could actually make, <laughs> to help the Bolsheviks break the isolation of the Russian Revolution. Uh, and we should build this. We should use this weekend and these lessons 
to, to use all our forces to build the necessary force uh, in order for this not to happen in the future. Uh, this, is, this is the thing we should, I think it was Ian in the panel yesterday who said, you should not just sit here and discuss you should think, what do I do when I come home? And I think this is what we should do when we come home, build a revolutionary international. Um, and, and, to, and to, what did I want to say? Sorry. Um, yes, and, and, and also to explain when this, uh, this is what I want to end on. Uh, and an important point. <laughs> and also to explain, because now all these jubilant articles will come, and there will be many on the left wing who will be too scared to defend the heritage of the Soviet Union. There were people when the Berlin Wall fall, uh, fell, who said, the Cliffite, for example, who said, but this was not a catastrophe. This was not, this was not a step back. This was a, se was a step to the side. <laughs> because they were afraid, because of all the horrible things that happened, they were afraid to defend they were afraid to make an objective analysis of the situation and defend all the good things and all the progressive things in the Soviet Union. And we should not fall into this trap of being overwhelmed by public opinion. We, are the w we have to defend the real heritage of the Soviet Union, the planned economy <coughs> and the huge potential and the revolutionary potential of the workers of this part of the world and of the rest of the world to actually uh, move to, to create a better world. Thank you. Thank you.